In this video, I'll be giving a relatively quick crash course into soldering. This video makes the assumption that you may not know very much about soldering, so some of the things we cover you may already know about. Just like with any other project, the tools you use can make all the difference. The first obvious tool is the iron itself. All soldering irons do the same thing, but the quality can vary widely, and the quality directly affects how easy the tool is to use and how long it lasts. A poor quality iron may not generate enough heat, or it might even generate too much. The tips on low quality irons also can be difficult or even impossible to maintain sometimes. This can result in you having to replace the tip or iron pretty often. To beginners, it might give the impression that they're doing something wrong when soldering, when more likely it's the cheap iron that's failing. I've personally had this happen myself. Even when taking proper care of the iron, I've had the tip of cheap irons just dissolve away for what seemed like no reason. Whereas my $40 Weller soldering station has performed fine for years, I haven't even had to replace the original tip yet. This frequently happens with these pen style irons. These irons usually plug directly into the wall with no dedicated station. Oftentimes the build quality on these can be pretty poor and the temperature control may be off or even non-existent. So if you have one of these irons, be wary that it may fail for reasons that you can't control. It may also be a lot harder to solder with these than it should be. The next two important things you'll need are solder and flux. A lot of times solder will have flux inside the strands, but sometimes you'll have solder that has little to no flux content at all. In this case, it's important to remember, solder is what bridges the gaps and flux is what allows the solder to flow. Trying to solder without flux is like trying to drive a car without tires. You could possibly do it, but you probably wouldn't want to. The main solder I'll be using is 8mm gauge 6040 lead tin solder with a 1.8% flux core. I also keep a second larger roll with slightly higher flux content to help with cleaning the iron. Next you'll need a tool to remove the excess solder off the tip periodically. The cheapest option for this is a wet sponge designed for soldering. Note that this is not the same thing as a dish sponge you can get from the store. Do not try and use a dish sponge with a soldering iron. It will not work. I personally prefer a flux coated brass sponge. It's somewhat more expensive but helps clean the iron and minimizes the thermal losses. It's also a good idea to have a sturdy stand for your iron when it's not in use. If you have a soldering station, you don't need to worry about this step. You'll also need some ventilation. While the lead itself won't evaporate, the flux will. When soldering, the smoke you see come out is the flux itself boiling off. Flux is acidic and can cause health effects if breathed in. You can get soldering fume extractors. It's debatable how effective these are. Personally, I use an HVAC booster fan with some ducting and have it push air out the window. And that's it for the required tools, but there are several optional tools which are very handy to have around. The first is a pair of helping hands, which hold boards or components in place when you're soldering them. Secondly, a solder vacuum or solder wick can help you remove solder if you've made a mistake. Other general tools that are very, very useful to have around are tweezers, needle nose pliers, wire cutters, both big and small, and a wire stripper, but if you're working with a PCB, you probably won't need it. Next, let's briefly cover some safety notes. If you've heard of the phrase, never catch a falling knife, the same applies to soldering irons. Irons generally run at about four to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and trying to catch a falling iron will probably end with you in urgent care or the hospital. Next, accept the fact that you will probably burn yourself, if not directly from the iron, then from the other things the iron heats up. A good rule of thumb is to never touch anything metal when soldering, if you can help it. Every metal part of the iron is gonna be several hundred degrees when running, and that heat will be transferred to components while soldering. So instead of using your fingers, try to use tweezers or needle nose pliers when you need to manipulate something. Now we can move on to the soldering method. I should note first that I am not an expert in metallurgy or welding. I wouldn't even call myself an expert in soldering, but I have had good success with my methods and I think you can too. One of the most important steps you can take with the iron is to always keep the tip coated in solder. The tip should never be completely clean of solder. In fact, you should try and maintain a thin coat of solder on the tip at all times. This is really important for maintaining the health of the tip. If you have a brand new tip or iron, generally what I would do is wrap the solder around the tip while it's still cold. After turning on the iron with the middle heat setting selected, the solder will melt and coat the entire tip with solder. When you're done soldering, you should try and clean the tip up as much as you can and then coat the entire tip with solder again, and then turn off the iron. This will help make sort of a protective cocoon for the tip, protecting it from oxidation. When you're first starting up the iron for use, generally I'd wait for it to warm up on its medium heat setting, use the brass sponge to scrub off the oxidation and the excess solder, then apply a little bit of new solder to the tip, and then use the brass sponge again. At this point, the tip should be nice and shiny and ready for use. This is where the large spool of solder really comes in handy. Because it has a slightly higher flux content, it can more aggressively attack the oxidation. 
The soldering process itself is actually pretty straightforward. First, position the component into the holes on the board. Pull the component close by the leads and slightly bend them outwards to help it stay in place. Next, you want to apply heat from the iron to both the pad and the leg of the component at the same time. To help with this, I usually like to add a little bit of solder to the end of the tip. This acts like a bridge between the pad and the pin. Take the iron and come in at a 45 degree angle. Press the iron against the pin and the pad at the same time. Next, from the other side, apply the solder to the pin and the pad being heated. Add enough solder so that it flows over the entire pad and pin. Next, remove the solder from the side. And finally, remove the iron from the pad and pin. Try to avoid moving the board or the components for a few seconds after this to just allow the solder to solidify. A good solder joint should look like a small cone shape that covers the entire pad. There shouldn't be any gaps in the coverage of the solder. If there are some gaps, reapply the iron in the same order and add a little bit more solder. Too much solder usually looks like a ball. You can often remove it without solder wick or the vacuum. First use the sponge to wipe the iron and remove the excess solder. Then apply the iron back to the joint. The excess solder tends to stick to the iron. If there's still too much, you can use a solder wick or the solder vacuum. Just make sure to reapply the solder to the tip when you're done with this. Using too much solder can also occasionally create a solder bridge. Solder bridges connect two or more pins together either intentionally or unintentionally. Clearing a bridge can be done the same way as removing excess solder. Remove the excess solder from the iron, and then apply the iron to the center of the solder bridge. Once the bridge is melted, lift the tip of the iron straight up. This will usually clear the bridge. And that's pretty much it. These steps can be used for almost any solder joint. Occasionally, you will need to remove the excess solder with the sponge. You also may need to use the larger solder gauge or a bit more flux to clean the tip. What you don't want to do is apply the solder to the iron and then carry the solder to the joint. With flux core solder, doing this will just boil off all the flux and you'll only have the solder left. Like I said before, solder without flux doesn't really work too well. Now you should have a good idea of how to go about beginning soldering. It does take practice, but the more you do it, the better you'll be at it. And as long as you take good care of the soldering tip, soldering is really not as difficult as it might seem.